And having had food for the stomach, we now have food for the mind, inspiration, with a keynote address from Shital Patel, who's the Assistant Director of Transnational and Technology Mission Center at the CIA. She's had a very interesting, very highly regarded career, um, served in Afghanistan, served at length in different roles in Washington um, and at the CIA and other agencies, and is going to be talking us, to us now about the question of how to manage the rising security challenges. And then after that, we're going to have a fireside chat between her and Doug Adams, who's also from Vanderbilt University, who's the executive director of the Institute for National Defense and Global Security. So over to you. Sure. Can everybody hear me? All right. Well, thank you very much for that great introduction, and thank you to Vanderbilt University for inviting me here to speak at lunchtime. So I hope you guys all enjoy your lunch. Um, if I am the assistant director for what is known as the Transnational and Technology Mission Center at CIA, and I am here to talk to you about, you guessed it, transnational and technology issues, specifically emerging technology. But before I get into that, I wanted to take a moment to pull back the curtain a bit and demystify what it is we do at CIA. So our mission is to be what we call the nation's first line of defense. We do that by collecting and analyzing foreign intelligence. U.S. policymakers, including the president, rely on the intelligence community and the CIA to, make, to provide the intelligence that they need to make informed policy decisions. So our four key mission areas are foreign intelligence, which is the collection of information on foreign plans and intentions, and it's done through various different means. Counterintelligence, which is neutralizing adversaries' abilities to affect our people, security, facilities, and our ability to operate overseas. Covert action, which is done at the order of the President of the United States, and all source analysis. CIA's core focus, truly, our bread and butter, is in foreign intelligence. Foreign intelligence takes form in many forms, as I mentioned. What we do in CIA is called human intelligence, or the recruitment of foreign spies. There are other agencies that have specialties in other INTs, as we call them, intelligence. And you heard from uh, General Hawk this morning, his organization is uh, predominantly involved in signals intelligence as well as cyber. And then you have open source intelligence. You have the National Geospatial Ag Agency, which does uh, GeoInt, as we call it. And our analysts conduct what we call all source analysis. They draw from all the different INTs to put a picture together of what is going on or their best assessment of what is going on around the world. On a more personal level for me, I would say the experience working at CIA has been outstanding. Right? There is never a dull day. There is always something going on in the world or some crisis or something that, that needs to be um, written about, collected on, analyzed. There are a multitude of opportunities available to officers that want to do something new. You can go to a new country. You can learn a new language. You can deal with new crises. You, there are new intelligence challenges, and especially in such a complex world, there's never a lack of some intelligence problem to solve. There is enough to do at the CIA to feed anybody that has any kind of intellectual or cultural curiosity. For example, I have served overseas. I have served in conflict zones. I have written products for the president. I have served at the National Security Council. I have run human operations, and I have run two mission centers. I, I don't know of a career where I could have gotten something as broad as that in one place. But at the end of the day, while every 
administration's approach to the intelligence community is different and their national security staffing focuses are different. Everyone relies on the CIA and the intelligence community, every administration, regardless of whom they are, for unbiased intelligence and the best assessment possible. And that is truly the mission. So now what I'd like to do, since I've set the stage, is take you back a little bit and tell you about the story of how the Transnational and Technology Mission Center came to be and how I came to lead it. So travel back in time with me to the bygone days of spring 2021. You might want to bring a mask. Bill Burns was sworn in as the director in March 2021. And while he was settling into his new office, enjoying his view overlooking the Potomac River and getting his first taste of the food from the agency dining room, he also was taking a fresh look at how we were organized and he wasn't fully satisfied. He wasn't satisfied with the organization. The food at the agency is decidedly satisfactory. Uh, so just a few months after he started, he commissioned a review. And the review, of, the review group's goals were twofold. One was to identify our most pressing national security challenges. And the second one was to ensure that the agency was properly resourced and aligned to address those challenges. So from the outputs of these working groups, it quickly became clear, not just to him, but to the rest of us, that we needed to ramp up our efforts on technology and China. So to that end, in October 2021, the Director Burns took um, three actions. One was he appointed CIA's first chief technology officer. Believe it or not, we had never had one who was just solely there for the agency. The second was he created the China Mission Center. And the third was he created the Transnational and Technology Mission Center which we call T2MC because, I, as you can imagine, I did not want a mission center that was called TTMC. It just didn't kind of flow. So we are T2MC. Note that it is not the technology mission center, and it's, it's very deliberate as to why we are not and why transnational is also part of our mission center, and I will get a little bit more into that later. So Director Burns tasked me to launch this new mission center, and three months later, we launched it. So from October to January, everybody was scrambling to create the China Mission Center and the T2 Mission Center. We have two primary mission uh, focus areas. First is to understand the ecosystems of emerging technologies. And we've heard a lot about these technologies. I sat through the, the panels and the talks this morning, and they were phenomenal. And I think you'll find a lot of similarities in what our focus areas are and what everybody is kind of gearing around. So we need to understand the ecosystems of these techs, where are their vulnerabilities, how are foreign adversaries taking advantage of these vulnerabilities. And second, we need to use these emerging technology and other transnational threats to drive closer CIA private sector partnership to advance our national security mission. This is the first time CIA has treated technology as an intelligence domain. We are very good at looking at it for like weapons and what else can be done and how to use it and how to exploit it. But looking at technology for technology's sake and what that means was new. And so what we have been able to do in our mission center is better identify the foreign intelligence gaps, task collection against it, and use the full range of the agency's capabilities to uh, get answers to these gaps. So now, and the other part of our, um, before I get into the tech landscape, another part of our role is to identify what I call is a team sport way of approaching these challenges. So we are, we have tended to be very siloed in how we look at things. And so part of our mission center is that how do we bring all the experts, and by all the experts, it's all the experts in the intelligence community as well as all the experts in the building against these technology topics. Because we have some phenomenally 
smart, deep experts on different technology areas, and they've been focused on the technology for different reasons, but they still understand that technology and what it means. So bringing everybody together is part and parcel of also what we're doing in our mission center. So now let's look at the current tech landscape. We've come a long way in the two years since we were stood up. It's actually almost three now since T2MC was stood up, and the technology landscape has also evolved a lot. All of you well know that we are living in extremely complicated times, facing challenges of strategic competition from a rising and ambitious People's Republic of China and from Russia. And Russia just demonstrates that even diminish, declining powers can have an incredibly disruptive effect around the world. But at the same time, we are confronted with Israel, Hamas, Iran, North Korea. There's just an endless um, array of challenges going on globally. At the same time, there's a revolution in technology which is changing the way we live our lives, the way we fight wars, the way we participate in trade, and the way we're going to operate our militaries. The importance of the tech industry has turned it into the modern day battlefield for global strategic competition. And this revolution in technology is central in the strategic competition with the People's Re Republic of China. So perhaps the most notable tech advancement, and we've heard a lot about it earlier today, is the rise of artificial intelligence. The landmark release of ChatGPT in late 2022 brought the power of AI into the public sphere. There is a lot of excitement in the private sector and in government about the transformative potential of AI-enabled systems. But as you can imagine, and I'm sure many of you also share, there is a lot of confusion, some uncertainty, and concerns about the potential risks of AI. For one, AI has the ability to create and spread disinformation. Publicly available generative AI applications could be used by our adversaries to develop synthetic content and influence public opinion in ways that undermine US interests. We expect foreign states' malicious use of digital information will become more pervasive, more targeted, more automated, and more complex as we go on. We are already seeing signs of this happening. So presidential candidates in Argentina earlier this year used AI to influence their own electorate, suggesting that Using generative AI for influence operations might just become the new norm going forward. The broad availability of this technology also means that AI can act as a great equalizer. And it has the potential to give asymmetrically equipped adversaries outsized digital capabilities. So what do I mean by that? So for example, we have observed that Al Qaeda ISIS and Hamas have all disseminated propaganda media that was either generated or enhanced using publicly available AI tools. What is also concerning about AI is that a lot of the risks that come with this new technology cannot be mitigated unilaterally. So I agree wholeheartedly with my NSA colleague who talks about the standards uh, boards around the world. And joining those boards and being present at those boards. And the danger of us not, like we could build the guardrails for AI and how to use it and we are going to build it and make sure we use it ethically. But the People's Republic of China and our other adversaries don't have to follow suit. So one of our jobs in T2MC is to understand how our adversaries are developing and using AI. Less consumer facing and possibly more important have been the advances in high performance computing. The ability to leverage large amounts of computing power is a key driver of innovation. And it's a driver of innovation in nearly every critical and emerging technology. Surging demand for critical edge semiconductors that enable high performance computing highlights to us 
why access to these systems is a critical strategic resource. It has also become clear to us that our adversaries and competitors view access to the same high performance computing systems as essential to meeting their own national security objectives. The pandemic also taught us, which was also mentioned earlier today, that it's not just the high end technology we have to worry about. Semiconductors and microchips of all types are used in more places and larger quantities than ever, from consumer electronics to cars and everything in between. Supply chain disruptions therefore represent a significant vulnerability. We have made understanding these global supply chains a priority and a core part of our program. We're also tracking developments in financial technologies, or fintech as we call it, the way in which money is used and transferred among people, businesses, and countries continues to change through new payment systems and the use of digital assets such as cryptocurrencies. These alternatives often provide lower costs, faster transfers to the traditional financial institutions. And policies and regulations such as consumer protection sometimes are lagging behind, however. So we look at how FinTech can enable illicit activity ranging from fraud to sanctions evasion and how it may disrupt financial stability by altering countries' monetary systems. And there is much more on the horizon. We are anticipating the arrival of next generation communications such as 6G and open radio area networks and we don't want to be caught flat-footed like we were with 5G and Huawei. In the past, we were not treating advances in telecommunications with the same focus that we treat advances in military technology. We've learned that lesson. We are monitoring emerging technologies across the spectrum and considering how they might be relevant to competition with our adversaries in not only the economic and military spheres, but also in the technical areas. Biotechnology is another one, and it is already here in many, many ways. The biotechnology space is massive, ranging from research studies to manufacturing processes, from biological weapons to precision medicine. But it is on the cusp of becoming even more ubiquitous. When it does, it will unveil a whole host of privacy and security concerns related to genetic and genomic data. What we want to know and what we focus on in T2 is what are our adversaries doing in this space, what data do they have, and how do they intend to exploit that data, and what does that data mean for U.S. consumer information. For next generation power, that's another area that we've been looking at, especially batteries and nuclear power. The global energy transition and global future energy needs hinge upon the rapid deployment of batteries in applications such as electric vehicles and grid level storage. With this fast pivot toward expanding battery deployment, the mineral supply chains of battery precursor materials such as lithium and graphite, are also critical. We are seeking to understand the battery sector better, not just for global economic competitive reasons, but also because of the many potential implications for military operations. Nuclear power is having a bit of a renaissance as well <clears throat> um, around its role in grid decarbonization. We are focused on tracking and understanding the role of next generation of nuclear power plants, especially those that are the small modular nuclear reactors. Some of these technologies are still under development and it's not clear they will be cost competitive with current established technologies like solar and wind. But we are highly interested in their unique capabilities for the same reasons we are interested in batteries for the economic competitiveness and military usefulness. So these areas that I just went over make up the six key tech areas that we see as the most critical subjects of global technology competition. And just to quickly recap, they are high performance computing, which covers AI and quantum technology, microelectronics, which includes semiconductors, 
fintech, which includes crypto as well as central bank digital currencies, next generation com uh, communications, which is 5G, 6G, ORAN, biotech to include DNA forensics, genomics, neuroscience, and synthetic biology, and next generation power, like advanced batteries and nuclear power. So now that I set the stage, I can um, talk a little bit about how we see the People's Republic of China and how they are doing in these technology areas. Director Burns has often said that China and technology are his twin priorities. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of overlap between the China Mission Center and the Transnational and Technology Mission Center. Both of us look at technology, both of us have a China focus. China's rise as a technology, uh, technology competitor has been striking. So in the 90s, China was not a technology leader in any way. Fast forward 30 years, and yes, okay, high-waisted jeans are back, so it might feel like it's the 90s, but it's really not. Um, the tech landscape is unrecognizable. China is now a peer or near peer to the United States in AI, high performance computing, communications, hypersonics, and more. Beijing is also implementing a whole of government effort to boost indigenous innovation and promise self-reliance and is trying to fast track its science and technology development through investments, intellectual property acquisition and or theft, cyber operations, talent recruitment, science, scientific and academic collaboration, and illicit procurement. Going through our key technology areas again, you'll see that China is highly competitive in all six. So starting with next generation communications, China is a global leader in 5G technology and got a leg up on us in deploying it around the world and at home. The jury is still out on 6G and beyond. Next up in advanced computing and AI, the United States is currently the leader in AI. We've got strong talent, access to more cutting edge hardware and better software but it is not an insurmountable lead. And the intelligence community's responsibility is to help policymakers understand the current and future threats from abroad. In the race toward quantum computing, the key milestones will be the construction of a large quantum computer with enough computing power. It will probably take at least several years before this is realized, and I do not anticipate that China will beat us there. But that isn't to say that they are not trying. And once this technology arrives, it has the potential to change the nature of our competition substantially, especially when it comes to data security. Third up is biotech. While the US and Europe currently have the lead in cutting edge research and technology, China's activity in the bioeconomy is primarily in low cost, lower complexity, and higher volume commodities, such as chemicals used to produce drug ingredients. However, there are signs that China is striving to move up the technology ladder in areas such as gene editing technology. China now rivals the United States in DNA sequencing equipment and some foundational research. Beijing's large volume of genetic data potentially positions it to lead on precision medicine and agricultural biote biotechnology applications. China also doesn't have the same concerns about data privacy as we do in the United States. On fintech, the United States continues to, to be central to global trade and financial networks, but China is looking to play a greater role or even dominant, have a dominant role in the international financial infrastructure. China is setting up its own cross-border payment system, which avoids the current SWIFT network, and it's leveraging its commercial influence to gain partners. China has also created a central bank digital currency, the ECNY, and is making progress on expanding adoption across the country. So we're gonna keep going into next generation power, China dominates the manufacturing of batteries and the supply chain of the materials that go into them. 
We have seen this story before with solar panels, and it's now repeating with new, uh, other new techno energy technologies. China is the sole or primary supplier for numerous battery components and precursor chemis chemicals, and it controls half of the refining capacity for key battery materials. PRC battery companies are doing more than just manufacturing. They have gotten really good at designing new battery chemistries as well. U.S. battery scientists are still leaders in many areas, but the gaps are closing fast. On nuclear, China has made rapid progress building out its fleet of conventional domestic nuclear power plants. Over half of the reactors completed worldwide during the last decade were built in China. The U.S. and others still have an edge on the design internationally, on the design side, but China is attempting to make progress as well in that area. On microelectronics, I'm sure you all know, uh, China has made rapid progress in advancing their chip-making capacity and sophistication. China is producing advanced chips for cryptocurrency mining, cellular devices, and AI training using existing equipment. By 2025, 40% of all the 28 nanometer legacy chips are projected to be produced in Ch China, just by looking at the number of factories that they intend to start operating in the next several years. We expect China to continue to make advancements in chip design and manufacturing, but we expect them also to face challenges in achieving high quality high volume production of cutting edge chips like those that are produced in the United States and in Taiwan, especially if they do not have access to state of the art extreme ultraviolet lithography tools. So I think what I want to just leave this section with before I go into the transnational area is the PRC is the most important geopolitical challenge we face for the foreseeable future. China seeks to become a world science and tech superpower and to use its technological superiority for economic, political, and military gain. In the years ahead, nothing will matter more to our success as an organization and to U.S. national security than how well we compete with the PRC. We need to understand the current and future threats from abroad to help us ensure that policymakers are well informed, but also to ensure that the CIA can continue to operate securely around the world and do what we need to, which is recruit foreign spies. Now, I've talked a lot about technology, and I really want to just touch on the other T in our name a little bit. So we cover, in T2MC, we cover a whole host of transnational topics, health security, energy markets, climate security, global supply chain, humanitarian issues, and more. And if you've been paying attention to the news in the past three years, you can imagine that our people have been pretty busy answering policymakers' questions on all of the above. Even still, we sometimes get asked, why does CIA care about these topics? usually with the implication that some of the issues I just mentioned are somehow out of scope for our national security mission. We don't take offense at the question. In fact, it's a question uh, we try to ask ourselves as often as we can. Because although these are obviously important topics, it's critical that we keep our focus on what actually is very critical to national security. Otherwise, we could end up with a very broad portfolio and the entire United States population wouldn't be enough to cover all the, the challenges in the transnational space. But the one reason we do get that question is that folks see security as narrowly focused on if, like, issues with foreign military or political elements. But what we found, especially in T2MC, is that these transnational and technology topics can no longer be siloed either from more traditional, what we call national security concerns, or from each other. And that's why it's so useful to have both of these under one umbrella. 
So I'll give you a couple of examples. Let's imagine that there's a crop failure somewhere around in South Asia, and there's a whole lot more to consider than just what actually happened then and there. It is, what are the implications of this failure for the country and the region? What does it mean for the country's upcoming elections? Is there going to be a food shortage? Maybe the country will be able to make up with it, with other imports. What does that mean for the global market, especially when markets are already short because of lost output from Ukraine? How could this have been prevented? Maybe farmers could switch to drought-resistant crops. Maybe new AI tools could help better predict damaging weather patterns and resulting crop failures. The bottom line is policymakers are going to want to know what caused this and what can be done about it and how it can be prevented in the future. And we can't fully answer those questions without a multidisciplinary approach. Another example is, let's say a new disease emerges overseas. The same types of questions are going to be asked. And what we would do is work with outside experts and other government agencies to get answers to questions such as, is foreign equipment being used to diagnose this disease, potentially, which would allow potentially bad actors to hoover up medical and genetic data on persons from that country. We rely on, you know, is there going to be, uh, in addition to disease facts, like what happened in this, what are the characteristics, where did it emerge, we're going to be looking at, is it going to create an environment where the disease could spread from populations where there, re, government is not ready to deal with it or where they might not expect to find it? So these are all the types of questions that go on, and we work with all our partners to come up with these answers. And the same principle applies to technology as well. Even when issues on the surface appear purely technological in nature, more often than not, there's a transnational issue at stake, global economic trends, cyber exploitation that impact our core national security um, interests. Foreign foreign example, we know AI has the potential to be an incredible disruptor in many spaces. What, the, what might this mean for national security and world affairs? Automation of common service sector tasks could cause major shifts in the global market for labor. If it is severe enough, it could put additional pressure on people to leave countries that rely on that work and migrate elsewhere. AI is already being used in the biotech space to identify new molecules and help accelerate the development of medicine. But could it just as easily be used to develop new biological and chemical weapons? And as AI gets deployed more readily into the commercial applications, we have to think even more about the potential and risk that comes from it. Imagine what will happen when generative AI is unleashed on financial data or energy market data. Finally, we know that like, to get generative AI and the computing requirements for high performance computing are just increasing. And the, to do that, we will need a lot more data centers. So to start, where will these data centers be located? Will they be highly centralized? Will they be distributed? Which companies will operate them? What level of access will our adversaries have to those data centers? There's also implications for energy demand. Water is needed to cool these facilities, potentially exacerbating water shortages in parts of the world. And we're only going to see more variable rainfall patterns. So what does that mean for where you put a data center? And what can be done about it? So there's a lot of questions that come up that that are in the transnational domain, but are linked to technology. So this growing nexus is the reason why we exist in T2. But I also know that the government isn't the only one thinking about things in this new way. And so I'm really excited to be here today and talk to you about what we're doing, but also uh, give you a sense of why we are, want to work so closely with the private sector on some of these topics. Events such as this one at Vanderbilt uh, allow us to come out and speak to people. I mean, for good security reasons, we generally are cloistered away in our building and don't talk to the public. And probably the public's very happy we don't either. But, um, but we don't want to 
to not talk to people at the cost of losing access to incredible insights that are in the academic and private sectors. There was a time when the US government was the key driver in most major technological innovations, but the balance has shifted and the pace has shifted. So nowadays, just keeping up with the innovations and the consequences of the emerging technologies is a huge task. But our job is even harder because we have to get ahead of the curve and see around the corner in order to avoid strategic surprise. We must understand and predict how the technology will influence the most pressing global issues we face. And while CIA's mission may be unique, just like the private sector and academia, we aggressively adapt commercial and open source technologies and continuously monitor the market for technological breakthroughs. We must anticipate how technology will interact with and influence the national security landscape. We also recognize that the technology challenges today are too complicated for CIA to take, tackle solely in-house. The only way for us to keep up with this technology advancements and how our adversaries are leveraging them is through our partnerships with academia and the private sector, as well as with our allies and partners around the world. And this is the only way we're gonna be able to enhance our understanding of global tech trends and applications. So I am here today as part of CIA's effort to deepen and expand in those types of partnerships. And before I conclude, I just wanna leave you with one thought, and it has been said earlier today, so I'm just going to reinforce it. Our national security is directly tied to our economic security. And at the heart of economic security is the health and protection of technological innovation. Since advances in technology, especially those of national security concern, continue at an unprecedented rate, largely in the private sector, ensuring we continue to lead in this domain is a national imperative. So thank you so much for your time today. I think everybody made it through. Um, we all survived the after lunch malaise. But thank you so much, it's been a pleasure. All right, thank you so much. She thought that was, that was tremendous. Uh, I was taking notes, uh, I'm not doing email here. High performance computing, semiconductors, genomics, neuroscience, power. I mean, we have 20, 20 minutes here to talk about a number of things. So uh, I came from a farming community uh, in the Midwest. Your agricultural example, the scenario, kind of a doomsday scenario you talked about resonated with me. And you made me think about an Oppenheimer reference that our chancellor made earlier. Uh, and here, here's kind of the setting up the question. I think the US demonstrates a tremendous um, speed and intent when our back is against the wall to do the hard things that need to be done. And you, you closed with this. How, how do we put ourselves in a position where we're not having to respond so quickly and be reactive, how, how do we become more proactive on those really hard challenges like the ones you laid out? So I think uh, you have hit on something that I have raised internally a lot in, in my office and with my colleagues. We do extremely well as a nation in rowing in the same direction when faced with something we need to respond to. And generally, it is a, a instance where you can see, touch, and feel it. Technology is a little bit more fluid, has no barriers, is not going to hit us in the face. It is, it is something that's going to come up on us. And to row in that same direction and counter and be proactive is a little harder. I think what we are seeing, though, is you see all of us in government coming out and talking, reaching out to private sector partners, reaching out to, to the academia to say this is a collective. And since uh, Russia, Ukraine, I think the private sector also has been much more forward leaning in wanting to work 
with government as well as academia. So pub public-private partnerships, and we heard that in the previous. Uh, I think that's the only way to do it. Panel as well. Okay. No, thank you. Um, uh, you you also talked a bit about uh, obviously your your technology focus, but also the the, the human talent that you've got. Uh, I think you said you have some of the most talented people on the planet who are tackling these challenges. Uh, you made me think of a former student of mine who just uh, linked in me um, a message this morning that she just went to NVIDIA and she had been at Intel. I thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, and it made me think about a talk recently by someone who was talking about the competitive landscape in generative AI and the fact that there are, there's a lot of competition over the algorithms in generative AI, but there's no competition at the, at the hardware level. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in terms of the stack that you think of. So how, how do you think about that? Uh, because I, I can imagine with technology and transnational in your mission center focus, uh, you, you confront that challenge potentially a lot where you have technologies where parts of the technology are competed globally and other parts are not. So do you want to talk to that? So I can, what I can say about that is part of the reason of understanding the ecosystems of the technology will get us to that because I don't think there was a complete understanding of which parts of the, the technology stack or the vertical, which parts do we already have a really good hold on the supply chain or there's uh, diversity in it and which ones are single threaded. Once we know that, then you can focus on how to do it. So that's what we have people looking at and working with experts. Yeah, and I th again, I think it's interesting, back to your point about the private sector, the fact that you're seeing more partnership, it, it feels like that affords you the opportunity to start to identify proactively maybe where some of those challenges may lie 10, 15 years from now. Definitely. It's, it's not just understanding that, but understanding where that technology is going to go and the potential for that technology and what is needed in terms of what is, what is being developed in the research side that five years from now could be deployed, which allows us to kind of look around that corner and say, can we be positioned to be ready to deal with that when it happens, right? Because when we're looking at things, we're looking at not just for national security and writing for policymakers, but also for our ability to operate overseas. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, you said it was a team sport, uh, the things that you do in this mission. Um, and that made me think about our, our student population uh, and the talent pipeline. Shout out to our students back there in the corner uh, uh, from Vanderbilt. Um, and the, the thing that struck me as you described this, the, the CIA mission, you talked a lot about really human development uh, in, in terms of gathering foreign intelligence. And then you pivoted and talked about technology. And a, a colleague of mine teaches a course on autonomy, and he says 30 is a magic number. Um, folks under 30 are very versed in the use of chat GPT and all large language model uh, type technologies. Folks over 30, not so much. And I'm curious, like, how does that, do you see that dynamic, number one? And number two, what, what are the ways in which you're thinking about addressing that? So I don't, I, I don't see that dynamic. I, I think because if there's enough intellectual curiosity, everybody's going to learn. Um, so I haven't seen this, this difference of, I, I don't, I don't want to use ChatGPT or others. I know a lot of people who use ChatGPT. I taught my 80-year-old father to use ChatGPT, and he loves it. Um, <laughs> Not quite sure he knows how to deal with any hallucinations or anything in it, but you know it's perfect. It's it's a great tool to do and understanding it until we actually put these large language models and generative AI on data, we don't know how it works. And until and you got to get a feel for it. You've got to be able to use it. But I haven't seen that divide. In oh, okay. Name. Okay. So you shot my anecdotal evidence really, uh, really to the ground. I appreciate that. Thank you, for, <laughs> thank you for destroying my premise and my question. I, I guess, you know, CIA, uh, Vanderbilt University, uh, enough said. Not a fair fight, not a fair fight up here. Okay, so back to, back to your, your weighty yes. topics. Uh, high performance computing, semiconductors, genomics, neuroscience. I mean, you, you really did cover a lot of thought provoking, I'm gonna say doomsday scenarios, at least in my mind. 
And so you made me think about the previous panel and the discussion they had around economic uh, partnership with China. Uh, and you yourself said that you can't think about what we're doing in national security with, without thinking about economics. And so my question is, how do you have a productive relationship with China when the People's Republic of China in every transaction, on every, per on every purchase, are potentially gathering and utilizing data uh, to act as an adversary? How do, how do you think about that? Let me see if I can answer this one in a way. I would say from CIA's perspective, that is a risk that we need to keep in mind in every thing that we do and how we operate. It is also one of those that is a, um, we have to warn policymakers, right, of, of implications of certain things and what that means for abilities to, to do certain things. But in terms of consumer policy, we're not going to get involved in that. Okay, okay. But does that, that make sense? That makes, that makes yeah. total sense. And kind of keeping, keeping along the thread, uh, we got a question from the participants here around kind of technological competition in, in areas that you mentioned, including energy storage. Mm -hmm. um, actually, a, a little known fact up the road from us about an hour and a half next to Fort Campbell is one of the largest lithium recovery plants in the nation. No one knows it's up there but it's really critical uh, when it comes to that particular industry, so in terms of you know, batteries right. for EVs. So what are your thoughts on uh, Chinese control of critical minerals and rare earth elements, the, the types of things that are critical to these battery systems, in other countries across the globe and its impact on US-led R&D product development? That was a long question. Right, um, let's see if I got this right. So what does it mean for the US Worldwide, right? That's right. Okay. So I would say the one thing that the United States has and the West has that the PRC does not are friends and allies. And so there has been a growing recognition around the world about the importance of these critical minerals. And there are countries around the world that are also getting a handle of the critical minerals in their countries and working together and jointly to ensure that we have, we are not held hostage, basically, to one country for critical minerals. Right, so comp competition. Competition, but, but doing it on a global scale. Yeah, is, is healthy and, mm -hmm. and leads to robustness and resilience. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And that, that makes me think of something else you and I were talking about at a break, which is a, a, a recurring theme, I think we heard General Hawk speak about it, I, I know that you referenced this, which is, uh, well, as the nation's first line of defense, as you described CIA, you talked about the fact that with the use of technologies that are rapidly evolving like AI comes a responsibility that the US doesn't take lightly. You know, it exercises ethical, legal principles uh, in operating these advanced technologies. Um, our adversaries, I think, as you pointed out, do not do not all do that, and specifically uh, PRC. Um, and so can you talk about not how that weakens the US position and strengthens theirs. I mean, you can certainly see how it would make them more dangerous. But can you talk about how it actually strengthens the US position? Does it have something to do with the fact that it garners us allies in a way that, that China would not? I think it absolutely garners us allies because if you look at standards and guardrails and the ethics of use of data and how we protect, just if you look at the, the HIPAA laws, right? All of those are intended to protect people's privacies, the laws that we abide by, by as intelligence community members. Those all ultimately make us stronger when, it, when you're dealing with a country that has no rules because you, you can't get friends and allies, right? There's no like-mindedness. But also, we're not a country that is worried about technology being put on our own data to, to on what's going on. The PRC is going to be very worried about AI being put on data inside their country. 
because your whole focus is on protecting the regime. That, that, yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about the, the risk aversion that would come with. You don't want to put it on, mm -hmm. on your own internal domestic data. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we had a chance to um, talk a little bit more about the, the technological focus. And again, this, this linkage between technology and transnational Really interesting. Obviously, the CIA had just thought of it because they stood up this mission center, and you're leading <laughs> it. It took us a while to get there. Uh, so, can you can you say more about? So, I've always thought of, of of mathematics, you know, as an engineer, as kind of a universal language in the sense that we we can all speak it and understand it and understand each other mm -hmm. in an interesting way. Is technology like that, or 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 does the fact that we're from different places uh, around the globe does it, does it make technology different? Or is technology somewhat similar to mathematics in the sense that it, it's kind of something that builds a bridge? I think technology is, is similar to mathematics in building a bridge. It has no boundaries. The, the, the technology, the basics of it, are going to be the same no matter which language you're speaking in. So I think it is a great unifier. It is also a transnational issue. It's just separate for us because we wanted to put a, a specific focus on technology. So I have, I have two more questions. Um, and one I'm going to take from our previous, uh, our previous panel. There, there was certainly a, a, a passionate uh, description of a number of different topics on our supply chain panel. Shout out to, to Kamal Sagi for, for leading such a robust panel. Um, one topic in, in particular that came up uh, is the topic of, you know, let's not just train, I'm going to paraphrase it in my own words, let's not just train the best talent worldwide, let's, let's have them see their future here, uh, you know, working, working here with us uh, uh, in support of, uh, of freedom of the United States, of the way of life here. So how does, how does the CIA think about that? I mean, again, I'm, I'm referring back to your transnational uh, you know, emphasis in your mission. I feel like that would have come up and that you all would have thought about that. I think the way CIA would look at this, the way we look at pretty much anything, is what gives us an advantage and what puts an adversary at a disadvantage. You take an adversary's talent away, you're putting them at a disadvantage. But that would, that would be how we would look at it. Yeah. So you would be in uh, agreement with the, uh, some of the previous sentiments. I'm not saying anything on any policy. <laughs> I'm just saying how I would look at it. OK. But nice try. <laughs> again, again, I just, I was well done. For, for the participants, <laughs> I want to point out, CIA engineering professor. It's, it's not a fair fight, not even close. Oh, wait. What, no, I work with an engineer on a day-to-day -day basis. He runs circles around me <laughs> constantly. OK, so it's just me then. Well, thank you. Maybe. Yes. So yes. She thought, I thought we were becoming <laughs> fast friends. We had that great exchange during the break. We are great friends. And, and now it's just all going engineers. in the wrong direction. <laughs> all right, so last question. Uh, I think. Everybody's going to hear this question a lot this week. This is a fantastic question. I love ending with this question. So, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night, uh, something stirs you in your sleep. Um, what, what are the wicked problems that keep you up at night that wake you up at night? So there, there is one that keeps me up at night, and it has been keeping me up at night since generative AI came out, which is there is a race to get generative AI onto intelligence data. So while the PRC might not want it on its domestic data, every intelligence service worldwide vacuums up data. And I think the first intelligence organization country, not like, won't be a competition internally, but which country's intelligence service puts generative AI on their data first will win. And I want it to be us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's that dream where it wakes you up one night 
in a race, but then the next night it's it's a pleasant dream because we're because first. We've won. Yes, it's because I'm going to stick won. to that dream that we have won. But it is actually something that 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 we talk about and worry about a lot. That this this isn't a race actually, and we do need to win. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, Sheethal, uh, Assistant Director uh, Patal, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Just really appreciate you being here. Great discussion. Um, thank, thank you so much for, for being here. Can we have a round of applause for the director?